Today's message comes from Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. This is the word of God. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out before. Came, came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I will share one more Sunday uh, on the this topic of the holiness of God, um, I know part three. First, I share about what it means by holiness of God and His great holiness. And then last week, I share about how we can understand our true self under the light of His great holiness. That Isaiah crying out, woe is me, and what God has done for the sinners. Now, today, we will look into the holiness of God in related to justice, mercy, and worship. Those three. Justice, mercy, and worship. Those three aspects, we will look into this. The text we read this morning, you might be wondering, what's going on here? What is this story about? And you put fire, and fire came out from the Lord and killed them. It's like, What's going on here? So let me begin with explaining the text here. Now, Nadab and Abihu, these are two sons of Aaron. Four sons of Aaron are mentioned in the Bible. These are the first two sons of Aaron. I said this many times. There are 12 tribes of Israel. Out of the 12 tribes, God chose the tribe of Levites to be the ministers of the Lord. They are full-time ministers of the Lord. And out of this tribe of Levi, God chose a person named Aaron, who is the brother of Moses, to be his priest. And Aaron is sons, and his direct family shall be the priest to the Lord. Now, other people in the tribe of Levi can be the minister of other area, other parts. But the priesthood, being a priest, priesthood belong to Aaron's family alone. So only Aaron and his sons and his direct descendants can be the priest of Israel before the Lord. And these two sons, if you look into chapter 8, they were consecrated. They were anointed to this duty of priesthood. And these two sons took their own censer and they put fire on it. And the text it says the unauthorized fire. We don't know exactly what that means. Probably they got fire from some other source, which is God did not command them, not according to God's commandment or instruction. So they put the fire on it, made an incense, and offered to the Lord. So instead of the holy fire they issued from God, they just ignored God's instruction, and they just did it whatever way they wanted to, and offered that. And ASB version of the Bible, that translation, actually called this unauthorized fire as a strange fire. They offered a strange fire, not according to God's word. And when they offered the strange fire to the holy God, the holy consuming fire came from the Lord and killed them at the spot instantly. There was no warning. There was no rebuke. Bam! And they died. This could be really devastated to Aaron, as you can imagine. I mean, I can imagine Aaron reacting to this because with his crushed spirit, he just lost two sons. And Aaron going to Moses and saying, what's going on? What happened, Aaron? Moses? Oh, what kind of God am I serving here right now? I dedicated my entire life. I devoted myself to serve this God, to be his priest. Not only I, my sons and my entire family. And this is what we get? Because young priest made a mistake and got bam and take my sons like that? What kind of God is it? Can you hear Aaron saying that? 
I, I imagine. And the Lord spoke to Aaron through Moses in verse 3. This is the Lord's answer. And I will read it from NASV version of the Bible. Okay, for this one. I think this version translated a little better. Verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. ESV version that we read, it says, therefore Aaron held his peace. Here it says, Aaron, <laughs> silent. He did not say anything anymore. I mean, this means most likely until this moment, before he got this explanation from the Lord, Aaron probably was complaining, what's going on? Why I got killed him and all that. When Aaron heard this explanation from the Lord, <laughs> he held his peace. He kept his mouth shut. In other words, even Aaron could not justify the acts of his own sons. Aaron was able to see that the Lord is just on this. And the punishment was righteous. So he held his peace. Okay. Do you understand this? Or do you still feel this punishment was too severe, too much? Do you feel this punishment was disproportional? Or even to the point that God is being cruel here? Just because they offer wrong fire? God killed them like that? If you feel like that, then probably we are missing something that Aaron got it because Aaron held his peace. When Aaron heard it, got it. You see? What is it? What's going on? That's what I want to address first here. One, His holiness and justice. His holiness and justice. We must have right understanding on His holiness that His holiness and His perfection demands justice on sin. And we need to understand what justice is. He said, by those who come to me, I will be treated as holy. Think about that statement. That's what the Lord said. This is not something the Lord will compromise. I will be treated holy. He will not compromise this in any degree. No one can or should undermine his holiness. Remember the story that I shared with you last Sunday, the story of Uzzah? that the Ark of the Covenant was carried by a cart and it was carried and it stumbled and the Ark of the Covenant was about to fall and this Uzzah Kuatai reached out his hand and grabbed and touched it to prevent it falling to the ground and God was, his anger was kindled against Uzzah and killed him. Once again, no warning, no rebuke. Bam! And he died. So some people say or see God of this Old Testament as sometimes as even irrational. He just hot temper. He just cannot control himself sometimes. He's a capricious, whimsical being, and you don't know what kind of God you will get every time when you approach him. Because this is why he judged people and killed them. For instance, they say, You see the God of the Old Testament, how he killed the, all the Canaanites? the people in the promised land, to tell them Israel to go and kill all men and women and children, all the living beings, show them no mercy. And they say, this God of the Old Testament has some dark side in him, some defective character. How can a good God kill people like that? If you look into the laws of the Old Testament, the law God has given, there are over almost 30 violations that deserve capital punishment. About 30. Starting with not only the first degree murder, but also if any Israelite commit or participate in the divination with the fortune teller, boom, deserving capital punishment. 
worshiping the other God, capital punishment. Adultery, homosexuality, even a child who publicly, willingly, humiliate and dishonor or rebel against parents shall be put to death. <gasps> what? Some say this God of the Old Testament is blood, bloodthirsty God, vicious, unmerciful. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like God will rebuild in the Old Testament is somewhat different from God will rebuild in the New Testament? Actually, in the early church history, there was a heretic cult led by a guy named Marcion. And he believed that the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament are two different gods. This God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, is cruel, bad, but this God of the New Testament, the Father of Jesus Christ, is loving and merciful and kind and patient, and that's what Marcion wanted. And he rejected all the Old Testament, and any New Testament portion that is related to the Old Testament, like he rejected the notion, Psh, no, no, I just want this God that I find in the New Testament. But what about the stories like in the New Testament story like Ananias and Sapphira? Do you guys know this story? In the early church in the book of Acts. Now Ananias sold the land and brought the offering, the money to Peter, to the church. And he kept some portion in his pocket so that he can have it. And he offered it and lied about it. This is all that is. And Peter said, you are not simply lying to me. You are lying against the Holy Spirit. And bam! Again. Without warning, without rebuke, Ananiah fell to death at the spot. Men came in and carried out the body. While the dead body was being carried out, his wife was coming in. And Peter asked again, is this all that is? And they agreed to lie about this. The so wife says, yes, that's it. Boom! She fell dead again. Carried out. Uh, how do you deal with that story like that? Are you sure the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament is different God? I see this. We still have some people who have a similar view of the Marcion. Brothers, sisters, let me make this clear. There is no other God. The God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. He is same. He does not change. He does not evolve. He does not get improved. He does not learn through over the Old Testament time to the New Testament. You know what? Now I learn. Let me not be like this. Let me change myself. He does not. He stays same. Everything they created in this world, they go through changes over time. But God, the eternal one, stays same. He's same yesterday and today. And tomorrow, he's unchanging God. We are not dealing with different gods. Then, we got to ask ourselves, because God of the Old Testament, we see, is also the God who is full of mercy, the Father of Jesus Christ. If we feel like something is not right here, then we are having biased, lopsided, crooked, some wrong vision, understanding of His holiness. When God created first man, Adam, God created Adam with honor, dignity, beauty, wisdom, and power and authority. God did not withhold anything good from Adam. God gave everything he created. This is why God created Adam on the last day. He made everything first. And then, Adam, you have it. You rule as a king. I give you authority and power over all creation. You can do whatever you want. Enjoy everything I created. I give it to you. That's what God did. One thing. Don't eat it from that tree. I take that as your obedience to me. So Adam was able to do permitted to do anything he wants, anything he desires, except that. 
And God solemnly warned Adam, said, If you eat of it, if you sin, what? You shall surely die. That's the deal. I give you everything. I bless you. I make you. I do all. But you fear sin. You shall surely die. That price of sin was clearly communicated to a man from the beginning. Now, church, hear me. Every rebellion and every sin, every willful disobedience, there's a price that you and I need to pay. Death. As Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, the ways of sin is death. At every treason, every disobedience, what is the price when you sin? Death. That was the deal. So let's get this straight. When you sin, on that very day you sin, what you deserve, bam, death right there. The sovereign creator who created you and I, who gave us everything that we need, who provide all things, who bless all, if you sin and rebel against me, if you commit a treason against your king, I am your king. And if you dishonor my holiness, then you shall surely die. That was it. The book of Numbers, chapter 16 and 22, says this. They fell down and they said, O oh God, the God of spirits of all flesh. Our God is God of spirits of all flesh. You know, we're all human beings. God created their spirit of all human beings, all flesh. So he can summon any spirit of a man to himself, the spirit of a person who just committed sin, and he can come and he can call and keep the accountable with him. Church, are you with me? That's what death is. That's what dying means. Death means the spirit of a person leaving, departing the body at the call of his creator. Call creator says, Billy, come. And my spirit leave my body, that's death. And when I sin, he can call, come. And my spirit goes, and what have you done? He can do that. That's that. Let's say when you hire someone to do the work at your business, at your factory, at your company, Right? And you provide everything, you give everything, so that the person can work there and get, you can get the pay and make a living, right? But he's not doing what he's supposed to do. Yet breaking things in your company and causing troubles, fighting with others, doing all the wrong things, what would you do? If you call that person to come to you, come, so and so, come here. And how come you're not doing what you're supposed to do and you're causing all this trouble, breaking things and you are not listening? And if you call the person and fire him on that day, is there injustice in you? Will you not do that? Can anybody find a fault in your character? Then does he not, God, also have the right to do that the mere creature that God created from the dust of the ground and whew, breathed into life and gave everything. And when that mere creature disobeyed and challenged his holiness, I will be treated as holy. Can he not call someone, the spirit of that person, to him and hold him accountable of that evil deed? I will... Be treated as holy. I want you to get that this morning. God must punish all sin and evil because He is holy. His holiness demands justice. Can you imagine a holy God that is okay with evil and sin? Can you imagine a holy God that is okay with wickedness? 
what should be really mind-boggling to us. Are you with me? What should be really mind-boggling to us is not the why these people were put to death, this small sample size portion in the Old Testament, why these people were swiftly, quickly, instantly put to death. No, not that. What should be really mind-boggling to us is be, should be the opposite of that. Why is this holy God willing to let many sinners to live and continue to live on and continue to commit a treason? Why this holy God does not execute just justice every time, every moment when the evil creature sin against him? Bam, bam, bam. He does not do it. But why he let them live and continue to live? The God who says, I will be treated as holy. You dare not. Why he's letting people to live and continue to sin and being patient? Why this God giving them time to repent? That's the real mind-boggling, wondering mystery. Because the deal was, if you sin, you shall surely die. So let me take you to this. Secondly, His holiness and mercy. His holiness and mercy. From this book of Leviticus, we are in Leviticus chapter 10. If you flip over some pages and go to the beginning of the Leviticus, and then you go each chapter up to this, you will see the God giving instruction how to make offerings. Sacrificial system. God instituted them. Starting from the burnt offering, grain offering, peace, sin offering, guilt offering. In detail, God gave them detail to this Aaron and his sons, the priests, how to make sacrifice. And in chapter 8, as I mentioned, God anointed, consecrated Aaron and his sons to be the priests before God. So let's pause right there. Now think with me, church, okay? Who came up with the sacrificial system? God. Who gave the priesthood? God. These people did not come up with it. God gave them. And think, why? Why the priesthood itself is, exists? Why sacrifice exists? God made the priesthood. So the priest can work on behalf of the people, pleading to God, God, please help. God gave those people. So God can show mercy to the sinners. The God of the Old Testament came up with a sacrifice system so God can show the way of life and give them forgiveness. Do it, I will forgive you. Your life is demanded, you shall surely die. But let any more be killed instead of you so that I can forgive you. He came up with it. This God of the Old Testament offered the way of life. He made the sons of Aaron to be the priest for that role, to show his holiness and at the same time to show his mercy. And hear me. And these sons who are called to be that priest to show God's holiness and mercy contempt even the mercy of God. They took lightly. Priest, sacrifice, incense. I will do whatever I want. God, I should execute judgment on you guys. But let me make priest and the sacrifice and all that so that I may show my mercy to you. And they contempted that. They made it a joke. Even the mercy of God. And you will see and hear, I will be regarded as holy. I will be honored before all people. Aaron understood what priesthood means, what sacrifice means, what incense means, that how his sons contempt the mercy of the holy God, and he held his peace. The incense 
was to be offered right behind the most holy place. So there's a room, inner room, the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant, the God's symbolic place, is there. And there's a curtain, and they made an incense right there, so the pleasing aroma to go into the room. You know what is in there, the most holy place? The Ark, which symbolizes God's dwelling place. The whole thing symbolizes God is dwelling with his people. This holy God, in his mercy, dwells with sinners after forgiving them. And they contented that. God of the Old Testament is cruel and bloodthirsty God. Read the Bible, my friends. When Sodom and Gomorrah was so wicked and so sinful, then this God must judge them and punish them because he's just God in his holiness. Yet, God says, if I find 50 people in the entire city, 50, 5, 0, then I will forgive them. And he went down all the way to 10. If I can find 10 people who are righteous, 10 in the entire population of the city. Let me just say, I don't know how many exactly in the Orange County, let's just say 3 million. If I can find 10 people, then I will forgive. You say, what about the Canaanite people? How God killed them all? God told Abraham, I'll give the Canaanite land, the, the promised land, but the Canaanite sin of the Canaanite was great at that time. But God says, you know what? Not right now. Not right now. He was willing to wait. Gave the time to Canaanite to turn around and repent. God waited about seven to eight hundred years or more. God waited from Abraham's lifetime, Isaac's lifetime, Jacob's lifetime, Joseph and twelve sons' lifetime, all the way four hundred years in the Egypt, in the by the time of Moses, and come to the Joshua. Say, that's it. The sin of the Canaanites is so great. And God used Israel as a rule, as an instrument of judgment. You go and judge them. Read the story of Jonah, the wicked and evil city in Nineveh. God told Jonah to go and tell them to repent. Then I will forgive them. I will forgive them. And Jonah didn't want that. And Jonah went, okay. And the city of the Nineveh repented and God forgave them. And Jonah was angry about it. I knew God. I knew it. You are so merciful and you are forgiving. Jonah actually wanted the city to be destroyed. I knew it. You will forgive them. You're so merciful. <laughs> One must be really wandering, mind boggling That angels must be wondered about. <gasps> Why? Is it not why these people were put to death? Because that was perfect justice. But is this why this holy God is willing to put up with these sinners in this way? The mercy of God. Why this holy God is giving rebellious, sinful humanity time to repent and gave the way to be saved and continuously again and again for the most of the people that they may continue to live and they say, you know what? God does not care. God cannot do anything about it. And in the blasphemous way, God is why he's letting them live in that way. Let me bring that to you and I church. Let me put it this way. What happened to Nadab and Abihu in our story, you must be wondering why that did not happen to you when you deserved it. When I did wrong and sinned, why bad things did not happen to me on that day? God is not obligated to show mercy. God owes no mercy to you, to the wicked. Again, if you hire someone and causing trouble in your business, in your factory or company, constantly causing trouble, constantly breaking all the rules of your business, 
You do not owe that person to show mercy. And, okay, continue to live. Let me pay you. Let me pay you. Okay, continue to work there. You can do whatever you want. You do not owe that mercy to that person. The minute we think and act as if God owes us mercy, that he should, he must let us do whatever we want, all the wrong things, and he must be fine with it, the minute we think that we are going to the wrong direction. Let me say this. God, withhold justice being done to you time to time and show you mercy. But God, in all his word, never does injustice. Let me say that again. God may suspend justice and show mercy, but God never does injustice. All that he does is always just and right. In his holiness. This is who Yahweh is. The Old Testament proclaiming. About this God. Exodus 34. Proclaimed. Yahweh. The Yahweh. The Lord. A God merciful and gracious. Slow to anger. Abound in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgression and sin. Let me say that again. Forgiving, forgiving iniquities and transgression and sin. But, but, who will by no means clear the guilty? What? This is saying God loves to forgive, but at the same time, he will never let the guilty, the sinner, go unpunished. He will never let the sin go unpunished. He's forgiving, but he must punish. How, 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 how does it make sense? How does these two go hand in hand? The ultimate picture of this holy God is justice and mercy, as you know, is the cross of Jesus Christ. This God is the Father of Jesus Christ who mercifully forgives sinners all their sin once for all. For those who trust in Him, those who repent in Him, He removed their sin and guilt once for all. He never hold it against us. Yet this is the Holy God who cannot let the sin go unpunished. So He put all your penalties, all your penalties on the shoulder of His Son, His own Son, to pay that price, you shall surely die on the cross so that He may remain as holy and just in forgiving you. God provided us a great high priest, greater than Aaron, greater than Aaron's sons, the true ultimate high priest, Jesus Christ, justice and mercy. Let me end with this third one. This will not be long. So, worship in reverence towards His holiness. Worship in reverence towards His holiness. When you worship Him, you must worship Him in reverence, church. Because the Lord here says, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And I will be honored before all people. Hear that? Do you hear that? I will be honored before all people. Do you hear that? This God is not, oh, that's the Old Testament God. No, let me say that again. We have no other God. God of the Old Testament is the New Testament, and He is the God of today. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changed. When you come to me, I shall be treated as holy. I will be honored before all people. He demands honor and reverence in our worship. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. This is why I'm against a lot of the charismatic movement of a modern day church. Their unbiblical practices that in their worship, some people barking like dogs and animals. Rawr, 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 and some people laughing hysterically, rolling or falling down, tweaking, tweaking this way, that way, screaming, running around. And they say they were drunk by the Spirit. They're all day doing that in the name of 
Holy Spirit. Where is the reverence to His holiness? Where is the honor in that? Don't you know that God is God of order? Jesus, who was full of the Holy Spirit, who was a full of the Holy Spirit with his wisdom and power, did Jesus make anybody, you read the Bible, did Jesus make anybody to fall down, to tweak, to bark? Do you see that? In the book of Acts, the people were barking, rolling, hysterically laughing, running around. Jesus made them, those who come to Jesus, Jesus made them more dignified, honorable, self-controlled, godly, holy. Other people are so ignorant. They are singing, they are praying, they are asking for the consuming fire to call upon them, to come upon them. Consuming fire? Are you serious? That's scary. They don't even know. They don't understand what that means. Consuming fire to you. We saw it today here in our text. What consuming fire came and did to the Aaron's sons. We see that right before this text. Did you know that? We we are at the very top of the chapter 10. Just go to the chapter 9 at the very last passage. Let me show it to you. Chapter 9, the last portion, it says this. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out before came out from before the Lord and consumed this is a consuming fire consumed the burnt offering and the piece of fat and on the altar and when all the people saw it they what they shouted and fell on their faces when they saw the consuming fire coming from the Lord they screamed ah and they fell down faces you don't want it to fall on you You don't want to ask for that. Whether you are worshiping here with us or those of you who are worshiping at home through online during this pandemic, brothers, sisters, come to honor the Lord. One way, dress presentable. Not like you're going to go to a market or 7-Eleven in front of your house or you're going to go to the beach right now. Or I'm ready to go to sleep anytime soon. I am not saying this because I'm an old-fashioned guy. Though I may look like you in my dress. But that's not why. Because here he said, I'll be treated holy and I'll be honored before all people. You come to honor him. The reason I'm asking people to come to church even during this pandemic, we come And as a body in this people, setting a time apart, come to honor Him. He demands acceptable worship that is with reverence, with awe towards His holiness. Let me pray for us. Let's pray, church. Father, we thank You for Your Word.